Testimony, the word of the Lord came to Micah, the Moashite, in the days of Jotham, Azaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is. And let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord, from the holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valley shall be clamped as wax before the fire, and as the water that are poured down a steep place. For the transgressions of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is the high places of Judah? Judea, is it, are they not Jerusalem? Therefore I will make Samaria as an heap of the field and as planting of the vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover uh, the foundation thereof. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hairs thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for she gathereth it uh, for the hire of the harlot, and they shall return to the hire of the harlot. Therefore I will wail and howl, I will go stripped and naked, I will make a welling like the dragons and the morning of the owls. And her wound is incurable, for it is come to Ju Judah. I don't know why I keep saying Judea. Judah, he is come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Let us pray again. Father, I now ask you to have you blessed on the reading of the word. Lord, that you just do what needs to be done in our hearts as we look at this prophecy here tonight, Father God, that we may learn from it. The Lord will be careful to give you praise, honor, and glory. For these things we ask in thy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Appreciate you standing in honor of the reading of God's word. And as we look here in this prophecy, uh, or looking at the prophet Micah, I want you to understand who is Micah. Uh, we, we try to do this every time we go into a new book or a new area. Uh, so I think it's important that you understand, as we always understood when studying the Word of God, it's good to know who's doing the talking, who they're talking about, who they're talking to, what is the main message, what is the main thing that the, a theme of the, of, the, of the prophecy, so that we may understand it more clearly and better. And uh, we, uh, I heard a preacher say one time growing up, there's going to be a lot of embarrassed Christians. If you can get embarrassed when you get to heaven, I don't believe you can. But there's going to be a lot of embarrassed Christians when we get to heaven. And some of these old, uh, some of these old time Old Testament prophets walk up to us and start questioning us or asking us about their writings. Did we read it? Did we enjoy it? Did we learn from it? How did it help us? We're going to be embarrassed whenever we look at them and say, I don't even know who you are. Now, again, I know that's not true in heaven. In heaven, we will know everybody as who they are. We will know and understand everything that there is to understand. But it, is, it was always used when I was growing up and going through school. It was used to get us to understand the importance of knowing who these people are in the Bible. By the time you get done uh, reading, your, uh, reading the Bible and studying the Word of God, we should know everything or mu as much as possible as we can about everybody in the Bible. We should know everybody in there. I know I was talking the other day, and we was talking about, uh, or a few weeks back, was, uh, I was talking about one of the prophets, and I gave a, uh, gave a little statistics of how many of those prophets or how many people in the Bible is named the same name as the prophet, but this particular, that particular prophet, we didn't know anything about. And I was talking to someone that listens to us online and had made mention that I never knew that was that many people in the Bible by that name and the one that you was talking about, we didn't know nothing about. I said, that's just how it is. We hear one thing like Micah. There's more than one Micah in the Bible. Okay? But this particular Micah, guess what? We don't know nothing about him. We don't know a lot about him. We know what he tells us about him. But I want to try to give you as much as I can about Micah. I did do some research and scratching around to find some things about Micah. 
basically coming from his word. We do know that he is a Moesite, a Moesite if you want to look at and say it that way, uh, which is a place more than anything, a place that is south of Judah, a place that is near Gath. Now Gath, if you remember, is another name that was one of the names of the tribes of Israel, the, the tribe of Gath. And uh, so therefore, it is a representation of a place that was set by God or set up by God by one of the tribes. So anyway, we understand that God's bringing these men from these areas to go and to preach and to minister to a different area in which they are from. He, uh, 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 Micah's ministry was to minister to those of north of Jerusalem. Guess who else was over there? Joel, Amos, and Hosea. So we understand that God keeps sending men to a certain area trying to reach God's people, trying to get them the gospel so they will repent and come clean with God. Um, uh, much, it's much like, uh, 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 and it also uh, Isaiah. If you, if you know anything about scripture and understand a little bit about Bible theology, Micah and Isaiah are some of the same writings. It is some, similar to the same things. Uh, uh, many of God's people uh, uh, were not turning in the ears of God's men. So therefore God kept sending these men to them and kept sending the prophets to them. And it's just like it happens today in churches in this day and time that we're living in. Uh, churches keep receiving new pastors along the way. And, uh, and sometimes it just blows my mind when you look around and you see how many churches there is and how many churches are without pastors and how many churches are searching for pastors. And I'm talking of all denominations. And, uh, and you wonder why is that? It's just like the church, the people in the churches today are not turning from their sin. They're not repenting. They're not being revived. So God has to keep sending men their way to try to help them, to try to pull them back to God and trying to get them to repent of their sin. And so therefore, you know, and you say, well, I know of churches that had multiple pastors over the years. Well, I tell you, the church didn't get right with God. You know, we, we need to get things right with God. The interesting thought here, uh, because of Micah's ministry, and this is what I kind of found out about this, and it could have just kind of blew my mind, but uh, because of Micah's ministry or the work in which he had done, a great revival took place during uh, the time under Hezekiah. That's why Hezekiah is mentioned in the very first verse, uh, just so you make a note of that. Uh, but it, that it happened during his reign. Hezekiah come later. But uh, this reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 6. And you know it very well. The Bible said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Uh, some preachers' ministries, all their ministry ends up being, it seems like, is their job is to go out and do the planting of God's word. They'll go to a church and they'll pastor to plant God's word. To try to get it sown into the hearts of the people. It may not be that that pastor gets to reap the revival or re reap the, the increase of that church because his job was just to come and to sow the word. And then another pastor will come along and his job is to do the watering of that seed which was planted. In other words, he begins to echo the same messages, the same pre uh, preaching, and, he, and, he's, and he's basically trying to help. God's the one who's going to give the increase. But it may be that another pastor comes along and all of a sudden the increase begins and the blessings are falling and revival's breaking out and that pastor's standing there like, wow, what happened? You know, this is great. I'm enjoying it. It wasn't nothing he done. It was by those who came before him. So we never know what's going to happen during our church, during this time that we're living in, based off of what may have been said or done in times past. Now, I always pray that, Lord, let me be the one who gets to reap the blessings. I mean, every pastor wants that. But we also have to understand that sometimes we've got to put forth the work. We've got to put forth the ministry and do all we can, whether we receive or don't receive, and pray that we do receive. And, and that's what I'm praying. I'm praying, God, all the work that's been done before over the years, I mean, what a blessing it would be to be able to reap what other men have sown in the hearts of the people at Royal Creek Missionary Baptist Church. 
And folks, I tell you, that don't mean that I don't need to try to plant or to water or to do or do so and then the seed. I'm still to do the work of God, but I'm looking for the blessings of God as well. And we all need to be on the same page when it comes to that. Hosea and Amos done the planting. Micah seemed like he done the watering, and Hezekiah, during his time, the great revival broke out, and, and, and the church was coming back together. Of course, we know that it was just a brief thing that happened at a brief time because Israel still haven't come completely back. We know it's on the rise. We know that the work's being done. We know it's going to happen, and it may not happen until the Lord comes back. Just understand, church, it, uh, what, what God chooses to do in the area in which we are ministering, God may not choose to bless that until he comes back. But that's all right. As long as we're still doing what we're supposed to do, don't give up, don't quit, keep push, pressing forward, and keep moving forward. That's the main thing we've got to keep doing. And I learned that from Micah. Because he understood when he went here, he was to deliver the message, he was to preach the word, he was to give the prophecy, he was to do the best he could with the talents that God gave him and then let God do what God wants to do because, folks, it's all about him anyway. It's not about me. It's not about Micah. It's not about anybody else. I'm just praying and praying unto God that God will have a great movement as he did in the Bible. So Micah was a villager. All right, he was a small town type boy that coming from uh, Moashite. Uh, so that's kind of, it was just a small little village, rural village town type place. And Micah being just a normal, ordinary, run of the mill type uh, man that God chose to you use. Uh, his the, what what's amazing about him, uh, you know, being a being from a small town, he had a big kind name. His name meant who is like Jehovah. So, in other words, Micah, when people heard Micah, they back then they understood every name had a meaning, and whenever they heard Micah, oh, Micah, that means, uh, you know, that means who's, who's like Jehovah, who's like Christ, who's like the Christian. I mean, can you imagine whenever he showed up on the scene up in the northern, uh, northern places that uh, they're like, okay, here comes that Christian, because that was what his name meant. Uh, being like Jehovah. Uh, his name is similar to that of Mike, uh, Michael the Archangel, which means who is like God. So you, you get to think about that. <laughs> Here's Michael the Archangel, who's like God, and then here comes Micah, who's like Jehovah. Man, I tell you, when you've got God on your side, you've got God behind you, and you're bearing the name of Christian, bearing the name of Christ, man, you've got the majority on your back. And you've got the majority that's supporting you and helping you and, and going out. You know, you think about Brother Dustin. As we had licensed him to preach, I'm going to use him as an illustration. We licensed him to preach here at the church. And he's going out and preaching the Word of God and ha trying to help these churches trying to get these, some of these churches established so they can move forward for a pastor or whatever God's put in his ministry and mind to do. But you know what? You think about him, you know, he's going out. And I know sometimes they feel like they're all by themselves. They're all alone. Hey, listen, my wife and I, when we went up north to pastor church up north, we realized that whenever I dropped the man off at the airport to get on the plane that moved us up there, that that was the only contact of North Carolina that I had when I was in the state of Maine. And he got on that plane and left. I thought, boy... My wife and I are by ourselves. There ain't nobody here for But just because we're not with him at the church he's preaching at, supporting uh, Brother Dustin, he's got backing here at the church. He's got prayers that backing him. And on top of that, he's got God backing him. When you've got God on your side, you are the majority. Just always know that, church. Always remember that. So we understand <coughs> tonight that, that's, that his name means that. Uh, and, it's, and the neat thing is that Micah represented Christians. Now, even though we understand that Christians not mentioned way over until the New Testament, with him being like Jehovah, he's like a Christian, and he represents all Christians that has a voice uh, that, that has a voice against sin and has a voice for the Lord's work. That's why our voices are good for folks. Is to be against sin 
and for the work of God. So whatever we're doing, whenever we're doing it, we're witnessing, telling somebody about church, telling somebody about what God's done in your life, you are a voice for the Lord. You are a voice that speaks out against sin. And can I say today that we as a church, we as Christians all around the land, we ought to be exercising our right of our voices and speaking out for the glory of God. Can I say this tonight? And I'm not meaning nothing by any disrespect, by anything that's going on in this world and by things that's taking place. Uh, I, I mean, I've got my opinions. I've got my feelings. I've got my rights. I've got my voice. But we as a church and Christians ought to be speaking out for God more than anything else. If they want to tear down walls, if they want to tear down monuments, if they want to tear down flags, if they want to tear down uh, uh, their, their standards and their morals, we as Christians ought to take a stand. And listen, they cannot take our flag away from us. I'm talking about the Christian flag, amen. They can't take that away from us. We can fly it if we want to. I'm saying, and they can't take away our Bible. They can't take away our, our salvation, glory to God. They can't take away God from us. We have a voice that ought to be rung out. We ought not be afraid to take a stand for God and God's word and what God says and what God means. I'm telling you, I was thinking today, I knew of a man. I knew of a man one time that was persecuted for his belief, that was ridiculed for the stance in which he took among people in this world. He, he, people mocked him. They beat him. They abused him. They denied him. And folks, you know what he done? He turned around and walked up. Oh, God got this hell and got on the cross and died for those people. Hallelujah. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. I knew of a man. I want you to understand that Micah's prophecy was a warning was warning, he was warning, well, his warning was of the day of re, uh, uh, a reckoning to the people of God. He gave us the Lord as, a, as the deliverer and also the condemner all in one. You need to understand that Micah, his writings are that of, of similarity, like I said, of Isaiah. Most Bible theologists, I'd rather read Micah and get their understanding over Isaiah. Now you say, well, why is that? Isaiah covered a lot, vast big, uh, majority area. Isaiah went in detail. People preach Isaiah. People quote Isaiah. People remember the things of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and all through the book of Isaiah. I mean, we preach, uh, you know, about the eagles in Isaiah and, and all those things that took place. Micah is hardly ever mentioned. How, why is it that they prefer Micah? Because Micah gives a deeper, more depth understanding of God's work. So therefore, you have to read it like that. Uh, uh, he was uh, somewhat of a poet and of a fine literature with his writings. Now, that might not mean much to some people or to a lot of people, but to the intellectual who desires uh, and prefers research and studying of things of God, it is somewhat captivating. Uh, in other words, it will capture your uh, your interest. It'll capture uh, what you want more than anything. I, I was thinking before I started studying Micah, and, and I read the first chapter, and as I was reading through the book, I kept thinking, Lord, I, I'm just not getting it. I just don't get it. And when I sat down and started studying and started writing and started understanding what Micah was saying in the Scripture, it captivated my interest to the point where I just lost the track of time. So that's what happens when you get into a good book like Micah. Now, I'll be honest with you, I like sitting down and reading a good book every once in a while when it comes to a missionary's life or a preacher's life 
and understand how God moved in their life and directed in their life and brought them through and, and brought them uh, from, from a nowhere place to, to a podium and a pulpit somewhere to preach the word of God and seeing the movement of, whole, of the Holy Spirit and, and how God blessed them. I mean, I, 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 I'm captivated by that kind of writing. But when I get into a book in the Bible such as Micah, I just lose track of time because you're thinking about, man, just think about what Micah is doing. I mean, small town boy going over there to Judah and, 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 and Jerusalem and preaching the word of God to a place that they already know the scripture. They already have the temples. They already have the religion. But here he is preaching the word of God. You think, why, why is that? Please understand, it's just like, it's just like back in the 1800s, early 1800s, that in 1700s, I actually need to go all back to 1700, there were many, many missionaries from the church that came from England here to the United States and was preaching the gospel and starting churches. Now in the 21st century, year 2020, we as churches in America are bringing up and training missionaries to go to England to preach the word of God. Why? It's just like here in the scripture, Jerusalem has gotten away from God, gotten away from the principles of God, and God's have to send men back to their hometown to get them to turn from their wicked ways. It's just an ongoing process. Makes you think, you know, if man would have repented, and if man would have made things right long, long ago, God would not have had to went through all that. But at the same time, then you and I would not have these special gold nuggets, so to speak, that come from the Word of God. Now, before I get lost where I'm at, let me try to get back on track. <laughs> but, but let me put it in simpler terms. Micah makes good reading. How about that? All right? <laughs> Just make, make it a little bit, little bit more simpler. His message is to Samaria, which is Jacob, and Jerusalem, which is Judah, and it is the message of uh, that, that he denounced. He denounced their greed, their injustice, and, of course, their graven images, their idols that they were worshiping. In verse number 6, he says, I will discover the foundations thereof. What was their foundation? Their idols, their graven images. They were basing everything off of that. They were building monuments. They were building uh, 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 things in which they were to look at and bow down to and worship. I understand why some people might look at some of the things that's in this world today and they look at some of these monuments, some of these statues, and they say, well, it is to, it might be to worship. Folks, it's not for worshiping. It never has been. It's for remembering. It's for remembrance of America history. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay? But what they were doing, they, they were taking it a step further and was bound down to it and worshiping. And as you'll find out all through the Word of God, there are certain things, certain key things that will, that will make God mad quicker than anything. And one of them is when we start putting other things before God, that becomes an idol. It may not be a golden calf. It may not be a golden serpent on a stick. It may not be any kind of stone image of any kind whatsoever. But what it is that keeps you from serving God, worshiping God, giving God credit, and giving Him praise and honor and glory, that right there becomes an idol in your life, and God despises it. He will uncover it, discover it, and bring it out into the open. <clears throat> Micah wanted all the people to let God be their witness. We've seen that in verse number 2, where he says, Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Now, I don't know about you, if the preacher gets up and he says, let God judge you. Let God bring judgment upon you. Let God find your weakness, find your sins, and bring it out. You know, I don't know about you, but that's kind of hard preaching. That's kind of the preaching that we look at and say, oh me, oh my. I want to hear about the love of God. I want people to tell me how good I am. 
I want people to just tell me that I'm doing the right thing. Just keep right on going like you're going. You keep doing what you're doing. You're okay. God don't care. Listen, pastor that loves you is going to turn around and tell you, let God be your witness against you. Let God bring judgment. Let God bring out your sin so that you can come pure and clean with him so you can worship him. See, that's, that's the love of a pastor. So we see that Micah has that love for the people because he's basically saying, let God judge you. Let God bring it out. Let God make it right. Okay? So Micah wanted all the people to do that. Uh, he, wanted, he wanted to let, uh, let God reveal their sin, uh, their hidden weaknesses, when it is revealed, then it, there is room for repentance. Until, until your sin is revealed in your heart and in your mind, when your weaknesses are revealed in your life, then and only then are you at a point in the place where you can repent of that and make room for the Holy Spirit of God to move. Until you do so, pride swells up. Pride takes over in your life. Whenever you get to the point where you think you're okay, and you're not doing nothing wrong, and everything's okay in your life, that's when you have a problem, folks. Don't ever get to the point where you think that you've overcome it, that you're beyond, beyond it, and there's nothing in your life that needs to be fixed. <laughs> man, I tell you, every time that God's man, whether it's me or any other man, God's man, gets behind the podium and then on the pulpit and preaches the word of God and lays that thing out there. It ought to convict your heart in some way. It ought to make you have a desire to do something more for God and change for the Lord. Now that's what the word of God's meant to do. It's not to always pat you on the back. We need patting on the back. We need the love of God. We need these things in our life. But until we come clean with God, we'll never have it. And that's what Micah is trying to get across to the people. I like it whenever these lessons turn into preaching times. I tell you, I, I really truly do. It's, it's just God's word being real to us. So how does, how does Micah go about doing this? We'll go back to that intellectual, intellectual type of writing in which he did. Micah pictures Christ as one that's coming down from the holy temple, his place, as he says, <clears throat> to tread upon the high places of the earth, to where the mountains shall be molted or melted under him, and the valley shall be uh, a cleft or divided in two, as wax melts be uh, with the fire. You ever light a candle and you ever sit there and watch that wax run down? You ever notice that wax when it pulls up down at the bottom? It's, it's, a, it, it's transforming from what it was to something else, a liquid that turns right back into what it was. Now, understand this. If, if you don't remove that, that melted wax as it runs down, as it, a, 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 what will happen is it goes right back to its same form. Now, understand. God, in God's word, sending the prophets to God's people were to bring out their sin to work that it would melt their hearts and liquefy them. So it would run down the mountains as water was running off of a steep place like waterfalls, and that would run away and no longer be what it was. But what happens? We catch it in a bowl and for it to return to what it is. Now, most people don't do this. You can if you would like. You can take that excess candle wax, you can reheat it to a point to where you, it's pliable and you can rework it and make another candle out of it. See, it's not really the candle that's burning, it's the wick that burns. It's God burning in us trying to burn away. Well, there's a message right there. <laughs> trying to burn away the things that's not needed and wash it away. Now, let's talk a little bit more in layman's term now. So that we may understand a little clearer. The Lord has come down and died for our sins to take away the punishment of sin. The mountains are our sins. They shall become molten underneath him. The valleys are, 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 are differences of beliefs that will be divided and melt like, uh, uh, 
melt like wax and flow away like water. Now that's what God's intentions were and what they still are today from the word of God. Now, I want you to notice the judgment. The judgment in which comes, uh, comes about that God gives Micah in these nine verses. The judgment uh, part is that the transgressions and the sin of the house of Israel will, number one, become heaps of the field. Rubbish. Now, when I first was studying this, now I'll be honest with you folks, before I grew up, right around the cow's fields, right around my house, I know what a heap was in the field. When it's wet, you don't mess with it. When it dries, you can fly it as a frisbee. <laughs> and when they're wet, if you step on them, you will slip and fall, and you're going to smell like it. But now that's not what God's saying, okay? I had to, I had to go a little further with that intellectual reading. And I had to understand that what he was talking about, he was talking about uh, uh, those fields need to be, those stones in the fields need to be removed. It was like stones in the field. And he said their transgressions and their sins were like stones in a field that had to be removed. Back in the day, some of y'all remember, some of y'all even had got, uh, got the privilege, I guess I should say, in good, good old days, of having a part of removing the stones from the field when you was doing plowing your gardens and build stone walls around the field. It worked for two purposes. One, it cleaned out the field. Number two, it built a wall to keep anything coming into your garden. So, I mean, it, it played a two-part uh, thing there. So God's basically saying here that, they, that the, their transgressions, their sins, were like heat in the field. The planting of the vineyard. In order to plant, you've got to plow the ground. You've got to tear up the ground. God's word is meant for plowing into our hearts and our lives. To stir up the ground. To, to break up the roots that may be binding us. To keep us from having the nutrition to grow what it is that we need to grow. The stones need to be removed and out of the way. So that we can produce a worthy crop. See. In our Christian lives so much, you ask and wonder, why does the man of God stand and preach like he does and continue to give the word of God like he does and then in turn turns around and gives invitations or gives an opportunity for us to bow our heads in prayer and talk to God and get things right simply because the, 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 the word of God is meant to try to clean you out, to stir up your ground, so you can bear worthy crop for the Lord. We here at Rowan Creek Missionary Baptist Church, <coughs> another good message, what crop are we growing? What crop are we growing to feed our community? Is it something worthy, or is it just something that's passed by? I'm so afraid that so many people have just passed by and let it go. Understand that anything that we can, I don't know where I'm going with this, but hold on just a minute. Just understand that there, let's go back to the graven images, because that's that was part of the punishment. Uh, God will take their graven images and beat them to pieces, and the hires or the gain that came from those idols will be burned. In other words, anything in your life, that's where I'm going, anything in your life, that you have allowed to take the place of serving God, worshiping God. It may be for your gain. It could be for your financial gain. I mean, you've worked hard. You've put forth the effort. You've, you know, you've built your nest egg. You've built up your bank account. You've taken care of business. You've done what you need to do. But understand, God's basically saying, listen, just understand all this is, all this is for naught because it's going to burn. You can't take it with you when you go, you know? You, you, you know, it, it's, it's only good while you're here. So just understand, if you hold on to it too long and you leave this old place, somebody else is going to get it. Amen. My mother was a firm believer in not having an inheritance, I believe. Because <laughs> she spent every dime she got. <laughs> I'm just saying, some people's that way. You know, I was taught when I was growing up, someone said, son, why you, you work so you can have money so you can go spend it. And I said, amen, I like that philosophy. I work, make money so I can spend it. So I'm going to spend it. <laughs> but in order to spend it, i got to work, right? I'm just saying. 
I'm just saying that the Bible's basically saying, God's basically saying, if you got any of this stuff going on in your life that's hindering you from growing, but yet you're growing in other areas, it's going to burn. I'm going to crush it. I'm going to beat it down. And, and, and we need to understand that God, God's, God will take God will take care of business when need be. All right? Now, last thing. <clears throat> because of this judgment, because of this judgment in which he is passing upon the people, there will be welling and howling over things lost. And it's going to be God doing the howling and the welling, by the way. Okay? God's going to be, oh, my own goodness. You know, I've, I've given, I've given, I've given, I've helped, I've helped, I've blessed, I've blessed, I've done, I've done, but yet they've turned away from me and they will not serve me. But man, uh, men will be stripped and naked of some things in their lives because of them not returning to God. And that's basically what Micah is trying to get them to see and understand. And the sin will be like an and, and, and incurable wound. And that was down in verse number 9. And her wound is incurable. For it is come unto Judah. He is come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Can I say tonight that the world in which we live in has been bleeding for a long, long time because of incurable wounds that sin has made. Understand that God is able to forgive sin. God is able to cure any disease. God is able to take care of any need. But there are some wounds that stay open simply because of damage done. You say, I don't believe that. When you get to heaven and you see Jesus Christ, look at his hands. There's wounds that will last forever because of sin. My sins put the wounds in my Lord and Savior's hands and for eternity it will be there to remind me of the sacrifice that he done for me. And folks, I look back. I look back. And I've seen a lot of people over the years that has fought for America, that has given their life for America. And because of the sin, there are open wounds today that we're having to deal with. God bless our hearts. God bless your life. Let us pray. Father, I now ask you to have your will and way done as we take this word that you've given us tonight and let it bore into our hearts that we may know the full understanding for us that we may know what to do for thee. I pray, oh God, thy will be done in our lives. We love you and we thank you. We praise your holy sweet name for these things. Ask thy name.